Hey there folks, I'm Mark, in affiliation with Spectrum Pulse, and we actually got a bit of a shorter week. Shame it's not better. And this, it's Billboard Breakdown. So the past couple of weeks have been kind of messy on my end, discussing the Hot 100 for very obvious discourse-related reasons that have been exasperating to trudge through. I'm happy that this week is going to wind up a little slower in response. And while I think my analysis has been pretty sound, these have been draining episodes to assemble. It's had the feeling of trying to drag folks kicking and screaming to a place they really don't want to go, made all the more frustrating because... 2023 has been a pretty rough year in the Hot 100, but I also am starting to think that it runs deeper. I'll have more to say about this in the coming months, but I think there is a paradigm shift happening when it comes to the charts that's worth following quite closely. And you know, for what it's worth, the music industry is handling this far worse than I am, so uh, again, we'll get into it. Case in point, our number one for a second week in a row, Rich Men North of Richmond by Oliver Anthony. And man, he has had a rough couple of weeks in which I feel increasingly vindicated by my commentary, and it also speaks to the paradigm shift that I'm referencing. But more importantly, the sales and streaming are still behind him in a big way. And even when the sales are projected to drop off next week, the one big correction that I will personally make is that I'm more inclined to say that his presence is indicative of a trend rather than pure novelty. But again, he's not going to hold the number one for another week. And I would say this would open up the door for Luke Combs and Fast Car at number two, thanks to good sales and strong streaming and dominant radio. But I'm also fairly certain that Zach Bryan might just roll right past him next week to take the top spot. And what's legitimately funny is that while I do feel kind of bad for Luke Combs, knowing his feelings about indie country and that scene, he's probably not even going to be that mad about it. It's a sign of better times. Then we got Last Night by Morgan Wallen at number three. It still has a lot of streaming despite having lost the top spot, but the radio is rotating it out fast. And then Cruel Summer by Taylor Swift at number four, where I think she might also wind up getting blocked and making her play because there's just too much of a margin to overcome on the radio and sales, especially when streaming saw a bit of a downturn this week. Then we got a legit surprise, at least for me. Paint the Town Red by Doja Cat at number 5, because apparently someone at Kimasabi and RCA realized that it might be worth supporting your one bankable star, especially when she has streaming traction, so the radio got flipped into gear. Again, she's running into a gauntlet of competition, but it's going to be entertaining to watch. Now all this kind of leaves Calm Down by Rima and Selena Gomez on the downswing because radio is starting to fade. It's no surprise this fell to number six. And Fuck You Mean by Gunna held at number seven because while streaming took a little bit of a dip, the radio is actually now getting behind this one. I have no idea how they're going to properly censor the title. It's probably stupid. Now this coincides with a dip for Vampire by Olivia Rodrigo at number eight. I mean, thank radio for this holding up at all because the streaming is not where it should be, and we wind up with two songs from the Barbie soundtrack holding up near the very rear, with Dance the Night by Dua Lipa at number 9 as, of course, the radio adores it, and Barbie World by Ice Spice, Nicki Minaj, and Aqua at number 10 because the streaming is really behind this even as the radio growth is slowing down. Now this naturally takes us to our losers and our dropouts, which in the latter case is a story of songs falling well short, which includes I See You by Coco Jones, Memory Lane by Old Dominion, and Morning by Post Malone. Kind of a shame on that last one. It really grew on me. Now, we don't have that many losers this week, mostly because a fair amount of Carol G's minor album bomb last week actually stuck around, with only S91 sliding from off the return to 69. And while we're talking about album bombs here, we got from Travis Scott, My Eyes at 91, and Topia Twins with Rob 49, and 21 Savage at 96. Outside of that, off the debut, Bad Idea Right by Olivia Rodrigo slid down to 23, it's gonna rebound. And The Painter by Cody Johnson lost hard to 94. But the more telling losses to me came with You, Me, and Whiskey by Priscilla Block and Justin Moore down to 78. And Baby Don't Hurt Me by David Guetta, Anne Marie, and Coilerae at 66. In both cases, looks like the radio may have gotten yanked 
I'm not really complaining. Now for our returns and gains, in which we did get a lot of returns, but I question how much they're going to last given that we probably have an album bomb coming next week, and the majority were low down on the charts. Turn Your Click Up by Quavo and Future got a bit of a boost off that Quavo album to 83. Good Good by Usher, Summer Walker, and 21 Savage saw a boost to 90. El Amor de Su Vida by Grupo Frontera and Grupo Firm rebounded back to 97. Fight the Feeling by Rod Wave climb back to 98 and Girl in Mine by Parmalee is back at 100. But what I find most interesting are the preemptive spikes for Zach Bryan because not only did Burn 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 return to 99, in the gains we also saw Dawns with Maggie Rogers spike up to 76. Honestly I'm a little bit stunned that it didn't get included on the new album. It would not have been a bad choice to boost some of the numbers and it wouldn't feel out of place. As for the rest of our gains, Amagura by Carol G saw a nice lift off the day debut to 85, and Jaded by Miley Cyrus continues to see its sporadic success at 64, but I think Country is seeing a lot more of the story here, because not only did Your Heart or Mind by John Party see a spike at 47, Pretty Little Poison by Warren Zader saw a considerable boost off his debut to 59, and a follow-up on this guy. He's apparently known more for a much more stripped-back sound and approach that is actually closer to Zach Bryan, but he apparently got the major label treatment to sound a lot more polished and Nashville's now throwing some weight behind him. It's going to be very interesting to see if this holds up compared to next week because Music Row may have miscalculated their approach here. All I am saying. But thankfully, that actually leads to a much more reasonable week. Only five new arrivals. Unfortunately, starting off with number 93, Summer Too Hot by Chris Brown. Is it with enough? I got a ride. It's a level up. You know, I was gonna go on a rant about how Chris Brown just never goes away, where even if we think we gotta break one of his dated ass album deep cuts recharts for the majority of this year, well, this is the lead off single for a new album, and am I the only one who finds the mix on this thing to be a total mess? Besides the awkwardly tuned bubbly bass hits and the fizzy percussion that clips against the mix that's oversaturating any of the melody outside of Chris Brown's really overproduced vocals, the entire song feels very cheap and off balance in a distractingly awkward way, especially for a song in this vein that's attempting to run Nelly's hot in here gimmick and with Summer at large as if sex is going to be what will cool her down. And this is all juxtaposed with Chris Brown continuing to write about sex as if he is a scatterbrained, immature, horny teenager instead of being around my age, or actually I think a little bit older. I get that this is more intended for the strip clubs, but you know what, man? In a year where we've actually gotten some pretty terrific R&B just outside the mainstream, the fact that the radio is still wasting time with Chris Brown and this is just depressing. Next, number 77, Fuck You Thought by Lil Durk. Only reason they know your name because of dirt, fuck you though. You try to slide, just slide, that shit don't work, fuck you though. So who feels like outside of the Morgan Wallen and J. Cole collabs that Lil Durk album did not do that much as a mainstream breakthrough, or at least didn't quite put him on the level that he or someone else might be expecting? I'm not surprised that he's pushing a deluxe edition now. Mainstream rap is really having a down year. Why not capitalize on a gap with a fragment that's got a little bit of virality? And, uh, you know, I guess for the more vicious side of Chicago Drill, it's not bad with a sharper percussion balanced out against the face pianos and some of the synths on the outro that almost remind me a bit of G-Funk that spray over. But then you realize that this is the sort of diss track where Lil Durk has taken aim at a number of folks. A lot of people seem to think that it's a reference to the Gunna song with that title, especially with lines in the second verse. But it also seems like there's a lot more lines about other crews that don't have his clout and may have been linked to King Von's death. And then platforms that put on some of these crews. We know who's talking about there. But the frustrating thing is that the song does not feel that direct. It's likely done to avoid litigation, but it winds up leaving a lot of the wordplay feeling kind of directionless, lacking focus, especially given how many rhymes just get dropped without reason. Overall, I've heard Lil Durk make this material before. I'm not surprised he's bringing back some of the more violent subject matter, but I don't know. In a way, this feels like a step back. I cannot say I'm a big fan. Number 68, Barely Holding On by Polo G. While we carry on I ain't perfect, spare me if I'm wrong Hey, uh, 
uh, Polo G, I'm intrigued about that new album, but you know you don't have to be working with Dr. Luke, right? Especially given that a lot of his production in and around Trap tends to suck. There's five other producers on this song, including Southside. Did we really need Dr. Luke's cosign for this pretty stock blend of rickety guitar, faint pianos, and brittle percussion? The thing is, this is just more generic than outright bad. Polo G, once again, does a pretty good job selling resigned exhaustion in the face of all the death around him, where he would prefer to just stay inside and not engage with any of it. Perhaps not a good idea to stalk your ops on Twitter and then go shoot at them, even if you're ultimately kind of remorseful and direct most of your second verse more at the families who lose people. I don't know, it's frustrating as someone who actually does like Polo G, I've wanted to see him get free of this nightmare that he either winds up back here or he just works with total hacks. Or both. As it is, it's not bad, I guess, but it's not a great sign for that upcoming album. Gotta say. Number 61, Standing Room Only by Tim McGraw. Okay, full disclosure, I've not checked for a new Tim McGraw album since around 2017, and the album that he put out with his wife, Faith Hill, that I didn't think was any good, apparently the tour wasn't good either. I know he put out a project in 2020 that did not get great reception, apparently his new album dropped last Friday, features a co-write with Laurie McKenna. That's not the song we got though, instead it was the single released last March that's only crossing over now. And look, okay, the problem I've had with Tim McGraw in recent years, it really just comes back to the production. The pedal steel is crushed into the increasingly thin guitar and keyboards, especially in what barely passes for a solo. The percussion feels painfully thin. There's no good bass line worth mentioning. And the vocal multi-tracking is synthetic in an increasingly distracting way. And then there's all the content, which is all about trying to live a good life. Focus on what matters, that you'll leave such an impact that will just be standing room only at your funeral. I mean, aside from the weird egotism of that flex, paired with production that reminds me way too much of contemporary Christian music. I mean, Tim McGraw already made this song nearly 20 years ago. It was called Live Like You Were Dying, and it was so much better than this because it felt personal and real and honestly had a way better hook. This does not. And while there's a couple okay lines about focusing on your own emotional vulnerability and your family, the soul is just not here. It's not terrible. I'm just in no hurry to check out any new album. All I'm saying. And finally, number 26, Call Your Friends by Rod Wave. But I just wanna do right, it's like I did so wrong, but want it to be my wife. Wanna pack up my clothes, my kids and catch us a fly. Okay, y'all know I like Rod Wave. A little bit less than I used to, not helped by his artistic progression, feeling very haphazard. But if there was someone to look forward to this week, it's probably him. And Okay, sonically, it's not out of character for Rod Wave, the subtle piano blending into the melancholic guitars as the brittle trap percussion slides in, and given that it's only one verse in the hook, it's still very light on song structure, much to my disappointment. But I'll be damned if he doesn't pull together some pretty poignant observations, especially in how his own vices have led him astray down certain paths, from being separated from his child's mother to buying a Rolls Royce with his own money for the flex, and he doesn't even really like it. More to the the point, I like how he digs into questions of his own confidence, not just in what his flexing is trying to prove to anybody, but also how he just wishes someone would give him a call, ask him how he's been, and not just for a favor or a scheme that could use his buy-in, where he doesn't even hold grudges against these people, he's just kind of lonely. I don't know, when Rod Wave gets a little bit more thoughtful and sincere, yes, it does kind of annoy me he doesn't go there more consistently on a full project, but the moments we get can be really good, and you know what, I think this is one of them. Even if it's a little spare, uh, I'll stick up for it. And yeah, he of course runs away with the best of the week here. And worst is going to Chris Brown for Summer Too Hot. No big surprise there. Next week, we could be actually getting a Zach Bryan album bomb, potentially even a new number one. The competition is reportedly going to be fierce. I'm legit intrigued to see how it all plays out. But until then, I'm Mark. You're watching Billboard Breakdown, affiliated with Spectrum Pulse. And I'll see you next time.